Let me begin by reading once more for us Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and starting in verse 1. You might join me there. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. I've been reflecting a bit about this section, this passage, especially here in the, the last several days, because yesterday was a reminder for me that a year ago yesterday we buried my grandfather and drove down to attend to that. And of course, you know, we've, as we've announced here in the last couple of weeks, you know, death has been on the minds and, uh, of, of several of the, the folks here, as, as Arnold has mentioned, and uh, as there have been some others as well. I don't know about you, but in recent times, actually for several years now, every funeral that I've attended and been at, at some point or another, whether I've gone up and I've been up at the casket and I look down, or I'm simply sitting there and I'm going through the service. If you're like me, the thought occurs to you at one point or another, someday that's going to be me in there. Someday they're going to have to decide songs, prayers, people to speak, these sorts of things if I don't see in advance and, and I'm able to plan for that. You know, we have to decide these things. That's going to happen. And especially for those who might be a little bit younger, you know, we sometimes have this fable or this fiction that my life is going to go according to plan. I'll finish school. I'll get a job. I get married. We'll have kids. I'll live my life. I'll retire. And then when I'm gray-headed or, or, or no-haired, someday I'm going to get sick and... I'll pass away, and then that kind of funeral stuff, we'll deal with that then. I think we need to understand that that is a fiction, and it may very well happen. Maybe that's the way it turns out. Maybe that's not, not, not the way it turns out. I think we all could sit here and go around the room and list people that we knew who were teenagers, their early 20s, so full of life and potential and a story yet to be written but we come to find out that their story was quite short. And I think the point that I'm trying to leave with us and to kind of think about this morning is take to heart Ecclesiastes chapter 7, no matter how old we are, because you are not promised not just another year. You're not promised next year. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised that you're going to do this evening what you set out to do this evening. And we all have to take that to heart. And the reason that we're told here, I think, that number one, it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting or of partying. And it's better to think about the house of mourning than the house of mirth is as he says there in verse 2, that is the end of all men and the living will take it to heart. The living realize that my life on this earth is so short and it's fleeting. And as we're told not only in Psalm 90, but we're told the same thing in James 4, our lives are like a sigh. They're like a breathing out, and it's there and it's gone. Our lives are so fleeting. And the question that we think and we're confronted with in the house of mourning is what are you doing with your life? What kind of decisions are you making right now that will leave a legacy that's good after you're gone? And I want to go ahead and stress this. Whenever it is that you pass away and people think about you and they remember you and the consequences of your life's decisions are being harvested by others, there are some things that absolutely will not matter. Who won the state tournament? No one will care. Who was made district manager? No one cares. Educational credentials? your bank account, and these things that we can become so absorbed and just think, my life really consists of this. That won't matter. What will matter would be, what kind of person were you? Were you honest? Were you dependable? 
Were you so focused on things that you sometimes sacrifice relationships and other people to achieve some earthly goal? Or are you going to be known of, that was a sacrificing person. That was a caring person. They were humble. But most importantly, this person was a child of God. They were a Christian. And so what I want to do is to think in this lesson this morning about our legacy. The question that we want to ask ourselves is, what will I leave behind? Because the story of the earth and the story of human history and really the people around you is, so, is actually defined by when we're not here. Do you realize my time here and my interactions on, on this planet with other people is just a very small, tiny sliver. And really the story of the earth and of time is my not being here. And so what will I leave then behind? What I want to do in the lesson is actually look at three different people. In the Bible, they weren't kings. These weren't people that necessarily had the greatest of political or other kind of influence, but they were people that left a lasting legacy, a spiritual heritage of righteousness. And I want to think about these three individuals and some of the lessons that we can gain from that. A couple of them, it is likely that most people, unless you are just the most of diligent and scrupulous Bible students, we may not have even heard of a couple of them. Uh, But that's actually case in point. Here are people that we haven't heard about, or most people on this planet will never hear about going through their life, and yet we have God's record that they counted and mattered to Him, and they made an impact. And that's really going to be my story. All right, about a hundred or so years after I'm gone, I I bet most people won't even know that I existed. Obviously, most people won't. And even maybe if I have grandchildren or great-grandchildren, they might know my name. But essentially, I will just be some kind of etching on a rock somewhere in a field somewhere. And that's all people are going to remember about me. That's memory, but legacy and consequences are a different matter. The decisions that some of my forebears and ancestors made impact me. Their decisions to be righteous or unrighteous, they have an influence. And the point that I'm trying to make is, even though our memory and our names might not be sung by poets in the future, our decisions have repercussions that echo throughout eternity and in this life. And so we want to look at some individuals whose decisions mattered, and they mattered for good, and they can for us as well. The first individual I want to think about would be Barzillai. Barzillai. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 17, where we read about this man, Barzillai. So as I noted, it's typical that most of us aren't as familiar with Barzillai. You know, you run into people today named things like David or James or Daniel or Peter. We don't run into many Barzillais, okay? But with that said, what a wonderful man and what a wonderful legacy that he left behind. So the setting behind the story of Barzillai is this. David is ruling, and David, after his sin with Bathsheba, after he had committed adultery, after he had committed conspiracy to murder, he had been confronted with his sin... And one of the consequences of that was that God foretold that there would be rebellion and there would be uh, a pressure against him from within his own household. And so, indeed, the, uh, one of his sons, Absalom, then usurps the throne and seeks to rebel against his father, David, and to win the heart of the nation. And so, because Absalom was so shrewd and cunning and amassing a, a, a foundation of force, He acted very swiftly, and it seems as if David and his loyal followers were taken off guard. And so very quickly, David had to get out of Jerusalem, and he was then going to flee east across the Jordan River, just so he and his loyal forces could have just a moment to gather themselves and to form a strategic reaction against Absalom's rebellion. So at this point, David's true fit friends were becoming very obvious because some of his old friends had defected to Absalom. And so now David is running for his life. He is vulnerable, and he's not sure who all he can trust. And it's at this moment that Barzillai and some others stand up and are counted. Look in 2 Samuel chapter 17, and we find in verse 27 that David is fleeing now. 
Now it happened when David had come to Mahanaim, that Shobai the son of Nahash from Rabbah of the people of Ammon, Makir the son of Amiel from Lodabar, and Barzillai the Gileadite from Rogelim, brought beds and basins, earthen vessels and wheat, barley and flour, parched grain and beans, lentils and parched seeds, honey and curds, sheep and cheese of the herd, for David and the people who were with him to eat, for they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness." So, not very much is mentioned about this Barzillai. What we learn about him is that he was a man of some means. He was wealthy. He had resources to share. And he saw that his king was in need. And he stood up and he offered to David and his men crucial supplies, logistics, at this time that they were so vulnerable. And what this does, it actually gives David and his men just enough time and resources to gather themselves and to strike back against Absalom and his rebellion. Well, the intervening chapters go this way. God is with David, and he and his men achieve victory in battle over Absalom. They staunch the rebellion. And now in chapter 19, David and his men return west back over the Jordan, and they're going to return to Jerusalem. And David, a man after God's own heart, is not going to let Barzillai's good service to him go unrepaid. Look at what David says and offers to Barzillai then in chapter 19 in verse 31. And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogelim and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now, Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. Now, pause there for a moment. As time goes by, 80 looks less and less aged, but so the Bible record has it. He was 80 years old. And it says that he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzillai, come across with me, and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, how long have I to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between the good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king. And why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again that I may die in my own city, near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant Kimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him what seems good to you. And the king answered, Kimham shall cross over with me and I will do for him what seems good to you. Now, whatever you request of me, I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. This, to me, is an absolutely beautiful story. Here is this man that in the greatest needs of the Lord's Messiah and his anointed, he comes on the scene, he plays his role, and he recedes back without any fanfare, without any look at me. He has done his job. And you look over, not only because of, of what Kim Ham can enjoy, but you look over to chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2 of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 2. And in 1 Kings 2, David now is about to die, and he's given his son Solomon some final instructions on how Solomon should open his reign. And we find in, in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, verse 7, But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, And let them be among those who eat at your table. For so they came to me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. So what we see here is that succeeding generations get to enjoy the fruit of the sacrificial decisions that Barzillai made. And what this really tells me is that you want to leave a legacy for good. You don't have to be young. It's not just for those who are older. Barzillai didn't take up the sword and spear and fight with David. He did what he could. And we need to understand that as I look at my life as a child of God and in my interactions with others, I'm limited. There are things I can do and there are things that I cannot do. Barzillai was not judged and expected to do things he couldn't do. And so he had the opportunity in front of him. He had the means and he did it. And so God doesn't ask me to lead people across the the Red Sea. 
He doesn't ask me to march around Jericho. He doesn't ask me to raise those who are dead. He doesn't ask me to do these things, but I can do what is set before me each day. I can impact one person for good. And I can be like Barzillai, and even though I might have limited opportunities, I can use the resources and the chances before me to do good, and it impacts people in the future. And specifically here, what Barzillai did was when a friend and someone that he was loyal to was in need, when many were leaving him, he stood up. And there will come times in your life where maybe it's an elder, maybe it's a preacher, a preacher's wife, maybe it's a brother or sister in the congregation, maybe it's just someone, a neighbor. And when everyone is running from them, you run to them. Support them. If there's sin involved, tell them the truth. Tell them what they need to hear. But don't just get them told and run. You stand with them. You support them. And that is one of the best ways that you can win someone and you can win their appreciation. But most importantly, it may be that their life is turned around or that they look back on that moment and say, it was because of so-and-so that I stood And they will remember that, and that is a legacy for good. And we can learn that from Barzillai. But what about another example? Someone else that we likely may not have heard of or have heard of as much. Let's turn over in our Bibles to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Second Chronicles chapter 26, we read about King Uzziah, who was reigning in Jerusalem over the people of Judah. Uzziah was a good king. He made a terrible mistake later on in his life, but the overall story of Uzziah's rule was that he was like David, and that's a stamp of God's approval. Look at what it says, though, about Uzziah, chapter 26, Second Chronicles, in verse 4. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now, at this point, we're told about one of the reasons why Isaiah's rule was, so, was good. is because God was blessing him. Why? Because he sought the Lord. Now, clearly this is coming out of Isaiah's own, own will and own desire to serve God, his own decision. But we're also told there that there was a certain prophet by the name of Zechariah, who understood the visions of God. And the idea is that Zechariah helped cultivate a spiritual climate around Uzziah and guide him spiritually in his rule. Now, to be sure, this is not the same Zechariah that has a book that bears his name. That one came some centuries later. That's a different Zechariah. But what we're told here is about this one prophet who had a good spiritual influence on this man in authority. Now, it seems like, okay, that's a quick mention about Zechariah in that verse, and we go along. But yet, I think mention of him is made yet another time. Look over to chapter 29. So as you turn a page or so to chapter 29, what happens in between? Uzziah dies, his son Jotham begins to reign. Jotham dies, his son Ahaz reigns. His son uh, Ahaz dies, and his son Hezekiah comes to the throne. So we've got Ahaz, Jotham, uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And so Hezekiah, we're told about him in chapter 29 and verse 1. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, or Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Now, we're often and usually not told who the wife or who the mother was of these various kings. We are occasionally told. And so I think what that tells us is that whenever the mother or the wife is mentioned by name, that there's a specific reason why that individual is named. Now, it can be for bad or it can be for good. And I think here we're told about the mother because of probably the good influence that she had upon Hezekiah because his father was certainly not a righteous man. Hezekiah was one of the best kings that God's people ever had. 
And it was with no thanks to dad that that was the case. His father was a wretched man, a very ungodly king. But his mother was the daughter, or sometimes that word could also mean granddaughter, of Zechariah. And I think because there's no other explanation, no other lineage given, the Zechariah must have been the prophet that was assisting his great-grandfather, Uzziah. There are Christians I know who were raised to be faithful children of God, and it was thanks to mom. And there are some circumstances where it was with no thanks to mom, but it was because of dad or because of grandparents. Never think that your influence doesn't matter. And it may not even be seen in the immediate generation, but what we see from Zechariah and his daughter or his granddaughter is that there is a heritage of righteousness that was shining in a very dark time. And we live in a dark world and we often wonder about what about the children and the grandchildren in future generations. Let me tell you something. There have always been dark days on this planet. As long as there are Zechariah's, as long as there are individuals like his daughter and Hezekiah's, there will be good shining in this world. And we can be the small people who make a tremendous difference. I want to think about one more individual. Turn over to Acts chapter 16. I say one individual. This is technically two, but surrounding the story of one other. And that one other, I want to start off introducing this, this last one by talking about Timothy. So we're introduced to Timothy in Acts chapter 16. What do we find about Timothy in Acts 16? This is on Paul's second preaching trip, uh, the beginning of his second journey. And we read in 16 and verse 1 of Acts about Paul. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So what, what's some of the information we learn about Timothy from, from Acts 16? We learned that his father was a Greek, and we understand by inference that his father was not a Christian. His mother was a Jew, and she was a believer. But you think about the chronology in Acts and the establishment of the church in this region, it's almost entirely likely that either he and his mother became Christians at the same time, or he was not long after her, right? The, the church was new in this area. And so it's not that she had lived her lifetime as a Christian and then had Timothy, She's a relatively new convert as well. But already by this time, Timothy was of such a character and was such a disciple of the Lord that the Christians in this region gave Timothy a good reputation. Paul arrived, and as it says in verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brethren at Lystra and Iconium. And so Paul decides to take him with him. That tells me a tremendous amount about Timothy's character and his personality as well, that Paul would take this young Christian on his preaching trip. And you know why one reason that tells me so much? Chapter 15 just ended by Paul saying, this young guy, John, Mark, is not going to come with us because he abandoned us and turned away from the work. I am not going with him again. And so he had a sharp disagreement with Barnabas and the two parted ways. And so right around, Paul turns around and he invites Timothy to go with him. And so it's clear that Timothy was of such a character and of such a caliber of person that Paul wanted him to go with him. But notice also it says that Paul took him and had him circumcised. Obviously, Timothy is of such an age that he could have said yes or no to this. Timothy agrees to it. And what this tells us is that Timothy was willing to do something that he did not have to do. He did something, he chose to do this 
in order that his influence among all the Christians could be what it could be. And there would be no impediments or even questions asked between him and his influence on God's people. What a tremendous sacrificing kind of mindset that Timothy had here. And as we see in verse 5, the churches were strengthened and faith had increased in number. And I believe that is in, in great part due to Timothy's presence. And the rest of the New Testament really bears that out. Look at just a couple of places with me that talk about the influence Timothy had and the legacy he left on these churches. Look over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So in 1 Thessalonians 3, we put together some information we get from this letter and then coordinate that with the book of Acts. And what we learn is that 1 Thessalonians uh, was written around the time of uh, Acts chapter 18 when Paul had just arrived in Corinth and then Silas and Timothy joined him, he writes 1 Thessalonians. And what had happened was he was concerned about that church's well-being. The Thessalonians were a new group. It may have been only a matter of some months after that church had been established. And so they're concerned about how those Christians are doing. And so what Paul did here is he sent Timothy back up to Thessalonica to see how they're doing. And then Timothy brings back a report, they're strong, they're doing well, they're facing tribulation with a godly attitude and fortitude. And so now Paul and the others write 1 Thessalonians as like a sigh of relief and thanksgiving that these new converts, these children in the faith, are doing well. And in that context, know what Paul writes then in chapter 3 and verse 1. He's writing about when he decided to send Timothy back. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Now, this is essentially two chapters after Timothy joined the group. And obviously, some time is going by, but it's not like years and years have gone by. Timothy was of such a character that Paul said, look, we've got some new Christians that are in the very furnace of persecution. we got to check on them. we got to settle them. Let's send Timothy. He'll do the job. What a tremendous statement in testimony to Timothy's character. And as he says in verse 3, Timothy was sent not just to establish and encourage you, but that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. Timothy was sent to settle a group. Can I say something here especially, not just to the young fellows here, but to everyone here, especially those who are young. You don't have to wait years and years and years until you can be a strong foundation of a church of God's people. And you can be an example of godliness and of serious commitment to God and His cause to where others can look at you and receive encouragement. You don't have to wait for that. Timothy was of such a caliber already that he was a blessing to those Christians, and you can be as well. I want to think about one other scripture for you before I start making the point. Uh, Turn uh, to uh, the book of uh, Philippians. Uh, Turn back a couple of pages to Philippians chapter 2. And this is, most likely, uh, quite some years down the road. And almost certainly during Paul's imprisonment in Rome the first time. So some years later, look at what Paul writes about uh, Timothy in Philippians 2 and verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. There are few people in God's holy record that were like Timothy. Timothy. What here is Timothy's outstanding characteristic? Paul says everyone has their own self-interest. And you can see that even among preachers today. 
exploiting congregations for financial gain, for reputation, using the Lord's church, using the platform of being a preacher to scratch whatever intellectual, academic, financial, or cultural itches they might have. Why did Timothy do what he did? I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Timothy's outstanding characteristic is that he was absolutely consumed by serving other people and trying to be a good influence on other people and giving of himself to serve others and expending himself so that others' well-being could be furthered. Is that true of me? Is that true of you? That's the legacy that Timothy left behind. But my statement and my lesson here is not actually about Timothy. Look over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, as this final letter of Paul is written to this young preacher, look at what Paul writes to him in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also." Grandmother, and then mother, and then son. The genuine or unfeigned, unhypocritical, pure faith that was first in them and is now in you. Yes, Timothy was an adult and he made his own decisions. He was a disciple, and so all of us are by our own decisions. But Paul acknowledges what contributed so much to the kind of character that Timothy had was grandmother and mother and then in him. And you look over also to chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 14, Paul writes to Timothy, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy here, from being a baby, was taught the Holy Scriptures. And for him, that's what have meant the Old Testament, the law, the histories, the prophets, the wisdom literature. His mother ensured, and possibly grandmother, that Timothy knew these from a child. And I want to say something about all of the legacies and the heritages that we could leave behind. And especially for those of us who might have the prospect of having children or grandchildren in the future. Of all the things that you could leave to your children. Yes, we're concerned about leaving a financial legacy perhaps. We're concerned about maybe making sure our children get into good schools. They have good jobs and they have all the success. If we don't impart to them the sacred scriptures, which are able to make us wise into salvation, then we have not given them that which is of the greatest importance. And we have failed them. And I'm not saying that to hurt anyone who maybe have come to the Lord late in life. I'm saying this to those who have the decision in front of them. That is the single most important heritage we could leave. And if we don't do anything else for our children... But they come up to fear the Lord and to love Him all of their days and to prioritize God over everything else. If we can do that, our years on this planet have counted for something. As Paul said, the unfeigned or genuine faith was in them as in you. As I think back, I think back about people, some of whom are living and some who are past. Family, grandparents, my parents who are still living. But I think of preachers and I think of godly men and women who have passed away. 
And there are times in which I become conscious of the fact that I think their thoughts, and I've said their words, but they've become my thoughts and my words as well. And they live. And someday your thoughts and your words, your habits and your heritage will be in someone's heart. What decides this? It's the decisions we make each day that defines who I am. It's not what I think I am. It's not what my parents were. I, by my decisions each day, make this choice. And what I'm asking you all to do this morning and putting before myself as a challenge is to choose the legacy, the heritage of righteousness to decide each day and to pass down. And I want to close by thinking about Revelation chapter 14 with you. In Revelation chapter 14, there's a statement here that really means a lot to me and I I think is important in this discussion we're having on legacy. In Revelation 14, let's read verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Someday, you will be laid to rest and your works will still be around to follow you. What kind of works are they? You are deciding right now what those are. And my appeal to you is that you would make sure that those works are works that God created and you in righteousness to do. And we would encourage you this morning that if you've not made the most important of decisions to become a Christian in full commitment of faith and full poverty of spirit and desperation in the Lord, then we would ask you to do that this morning. And it may be that other generations leading up to you have not made their, uh, the right decision, but they've made their decisions. You can't affect that. You can affect yourself. And you can maybe leave a legacy for others in the future to look back on and to follow. And if there's any way now that this morning we can assist you in becoming a Christian or in encouraging you and strengthening you in your walk with the Lord, then make that known to us while we stand and sing this song of encouragement. 332.